Thank you. Chairman Lowenthal, Chairman DeSonia, members of the committee, I'm Dan Richard. Uh, I am one of uh, Governor Brown's appointees to the High Speed Rail Authority. Um, members, I'd uh, like to just make a few points uh, uh, and respond to some of the questions that have come up, and of course we'll, we'll continue to do that. Um, first of all, just to emphasize that this draft plan, and Senator Simidian was right, this is a draft plan. We've, you've already seen us embrace some of the major criticisms that have come towards the uh, authority and embrace those and embody them in the plan, and that's a process that we will continue. So as we get information and input, uh, our thinking is still evolving on this, uh, at, le at least from my perspective it is, and I think that other members of the board feel exactly the same way. But it's a departure from past plans in a number of critical ways. Uh, my colleagues have, have spoken about the, uh, the blended approach. I think what's beyond that, is, what's, what's really behind that, is a sense that this is a, a different idea in that we no longer view high-speed rail as a separate insular system to be superimposed on a map of California, but in fact an integral part of California's rail network. And we have, <clears throat> we have been working with, and in fact we were privileged to have, people from Caltrain, people from Los Angeles Metro, people from Orange County Transportation Authority coming in and working with us to develop the ideas in that chapter two of the plan that talks about how we're going to do this. And we've continued to reach out to them. We're looking for ways to, to work towards joint funding programs and other things that will strengthen all of our regional rail networks because there is an interconnected whole here. We get riders from and contribute riders to systems like Metrolink and Caltrain. And that is a philosophy that I think is infused in this report and it's going to be very, very important as we're going forward. The second point I want to make, and I want to make it carefully, is that the private sector is involved in this program from day one. Now, the questions that came from Chair Lowenthal and also from Senator Gaines really go to kind of ultimate private sector role in terms of operation. And my colleague, Mr. Rossi, who has a tremendous depth of experience in this area, is and, going... And risk, and risk assessment. Yes, sir. And risk which assessment. Which is the critical issue to the... Uh, and Mr. Rossi, is, is, uh, who has a tremendous depth of experience, is going to talk to those. But I, I, I don't want to forget about the early stages. Our plan involves the use of a design build, which means that... Uh, the public agency will only design about 30 percent of this, and the private sector would come in and complete the design and do the construction. So that from the beginning, we depend on the innovation and expertise of the private sector. And then as we go forward, we see growing private sector role, and I'll leave it to Mr. Rossi to, to go into that, but I, I wanted to at least make that point. The costs um, are up, there is no question about it, but I would call your attention to a couple of things. First of all, um, we didn't go from 43 to 98 billion. The 98 billion dollars is year of expenditure dollars, and we wanted to lay that out. Thank you, Senator Simidian, for the compliment. Uh, it's not easy standing up and saying it's actually going to cost close to 100 billion dollars, but in fact, a huge chunk of that is inflationary effects. Uh, Chair Umberg mentioned that if the inflation rate was lower, just to point a fine point on that, if the inflation rate for the next three years is the same as it was for the last three years, and then we jumped to our 3% assumption after that, $5.1 billion comes off the cost of this thing immediately. So time is not our friend here. These cost numbers are driven by the fact that it's going to take a considerable amount of time to build the system out. The inflationary effects, basically the comparison is uh, the last business plan you saw was $43 billion in 2010 dollars. In co those constant dollars, we would be about 65. The rest is inflationary effects. And so a part of our challenge to the Congress and others is you want to help us lop tens of billions of dollars off this? Help us do it quicker. And that goes, I think, to the issue that Senator Simidian raised and Senator LaMalfa raised about uh, being able to go back to the administration and trying to get uh, more time. Uh, I don't think you'll find anybody on this authority who would not like to have uh, a little breathing room because we feel the, 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 the pressure to, to move this forward. Uh, having said that, these dollars do come out of the Federal Stimulus Act. 
and they were intended to put people to work as quickly as possible. And so, um, you know, we, we could take Ray LaHood out for a beer, but I'm not sure that they're going to want to give us that much relief because they want to put people to work. So, and, as I said before, time is not our friend. Senator Smitty, and I don't mean in any way to be pushing back against what you're saying, or Senator Lamalfa, I'm just saying that there are those other imperatives. Within those, I think your call to us to be as thoughtful and, and, and flexible as possible is certainly appropriate, but I don't think it's going to be an easy matter. Um, having said that, the real uh, essence of this plan is to focus on the initial operating segment. We, don't, we do not need to get $98 billion, and Mr. Rossi is going to talk about what fraction of that we believe is going to come from the private sector in any case. So those are not all public dollars. Um, what we need is to build an initial operating segment. That changes everything. And that initial operating segment can go either from Bakersfield to San Jose or it can go from Merced to the Gateway to Los Angeles. That leg, let's assume we do the, the second one I mentioned, would be about $33 billion year of expenditure could be built within 10 years. Uh, of that $33 billion, we presently have the $3 billion in stimulus funds. We have up to the $9 billion of state bonding authority, assuming that we could find matching dollars for that. So that leaves us about $20 billion short. When we build the initial operating segment, several things will happen. First of all, we will connect the Central Valley, one of the fastest growing areas of our state, with one of our mega cities. And for people back east to refer to the Central Valley as a place from nowhere, uh, I would like to point out that there are 4.2, 4.4 million people who live there. On a standalone basis, it's bigger than 24 other states of the United States, including states like Oregon and Connecticut, the latter of which has a very robust rail network. So we're not talking about nowhere, and I think Senator Rubio, I hope, appreciates my saying that. Um, we're talking about a major population center that's growing very, very quickly. Uh, and it will connect that area with one of our mega cities. And we already have significant interest in rail traffic through the valley. We have significant interest in rail transportation up through LA. And we have the opportunity, at least at the initial part, to bring this system to closure, to handshake between those, those two areas. It'll be very important. It will, in our view, trigger private sector investment. It will be the first time high-speed rail comes to California and maybe to America. We believe also that it will trigger a significant technological base in California. Finally, I would just like to uh, close by saying that we do have to look at the alternatives, as Senator DeSonia said. Uh, we have to look at those issues. We have to look at them in detail. Our economic estimates that we have in the plan indicate that some of those alternatives could cost up to $170 billion. If we're off, uh, LAO at one of the hearings suggested we, that might be off by 40 percent. If we're off by 40 percent, it still costs more than doing high-speed rail. And it, that cost does not even consider the environmental cost and, and other attributes. So we have to look very closely at that, and that, of course, is the challenge that you have as policymakers to make those kinds of uh, decisions. Um, finally, I thought it was very important that when we rolled out this draft business plan, there were very strong statements of support from some of our most progressive mayors in this state. Mayor Villaraigosa, Mayor Chuck Reed of San Jose, uh, Mayor Lee of San Francisco, Mayor Swearingen of Fresno, a bipartisan group of mayors. Why? Because in an era of SB 375, they see high-speed rail not just as a conveyance system, but as an opportunity to shape how their communities grow in the future. And this, I think, is one of the other things that we at the Authority have to focus on as well. So it's, it's a privilege to appear before you today. I'm pleased to answer any other questions that you have.